Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, welcome to day two, and we are talking about um, flame stretch and edge flames and flame stabilization. <clears throat> so what I did last class um, was I just kind of tried to get you thinking about the whole topic of flame stabilization and some of the issues around flame stabilization in real devices, and what I... And, and that immediately flows some, some kind of critical science questions that flow out of um, flame stabilization is under what conditions can a flame stabilize in a region with very, very high shear or with very strong velocity gradients um, because that stretches a flame. Uh, what happens to a flame when it has an edge to it, which is what happens when you have a stabilized flame. Uh, so those are, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about flame stretch and edge flames, um, just from a very fundamental point of view. And then what I'll do later on is then bring it back and talk a little bit more about flame stabilization and shear layers and talk about what is the stretch rate of a flame sitting in a shear layer. Um, how is it that flames can be stabilized by stagnation points and things like that. So that's sort of our outline. And so we are talking about flame stretch. And I had a teed it up with these two examples. Uh, one was a problem where the flow was one-dimensional and the flame was curved. And the other problem where the flame was flat, the flame was one, uh, nominally one-dimensional, and the flow streamlines were curved. And in both cases, we had done a um, sort of an, just an informal energy uh, or enthalpy balance in the, uh, of the preheat zone. And you know, when you, you basically, when you're in the preheat zone, you have a balance between convection and diffusion, right? So you have enthalpy convecting in and enthalpy convecting out. And um, we had talked about how uh, that when you had, in either of these two situations, you had the potential for the control volume, for enthalpy to be, to, enthalpy to be diffused out of your control volume, either thermally or through ke chemical enthalpy. And so in fact, you could either have the enthalpy uh, be higher or lower than uh, what's coming in, and therefore for your, your local flame temperature to be greater than or less than the adiabatic flame temperature. So that was a uh, sort of an informal focus. Now I want to talk about it a little bit more specifically, and I guess just the last point we had left with last class was, was that the common theme to both of these problems, to these steady state problems, uh, was there's a misaligned uh, convective and diffusive fluxes, that the convective and diffusive fluxes aren't going in the same direction. Um, so let's talk about flame stretch a little bit more formally now. And what this slide does is it just repeats the same things I just said, just a little bit more formally, and just saying consider a stationary flame, focus on a control volume, which is the intersection of a stream tube and the flame, so the same control volume. And then what we have here is our energy equation. So we have a convection term, we have a convective enthalpy term and we have the enthalpy diffusion term and that enthalpy diffusion term consists of a the heat flux term and the mass flux term all right so we had done this in formal analysis before where we had talked about the heat flux term for example over here that because heat is um, is diffusing normal to isotherms you're basically going to have thermal energy or, or, or heat flowing into the side of this control volume if you have a curved flame. And for this configuration, you have the situation where you actually have heat flowing out of the control volume um, for this diverging flow. If the flow is converging, the opposite would be happening. You'd have uh, heat um, coming into the control volume. And then you have mass flux. And remember, mass is diffusing normal to ISO uh, concentration lines, ISO and, and so we had talked about, and that, that leads to chemical energy, um, uh, chemical uh, energy or enthalpy diffusing in or out. So, <clears throat> again, just to sort of repeat the, uh, what we talked about before a little bit more formally, the basic question when you're looking at flame stretch, is there a net enthalpy loss or gain inside of the control volume because of diffusion fluxes through its lateral surface? That's kind of one question. And the other question also stated here, is there a net um, change in composition inside the control volume because of diffusion fluxes through the lateral surface? So what I mean by is there a change in composition would be that 
you know, if, if we have stuff flowing into the stream tube, let's just say there's a, there's a macro uh, um, equivalence ratio. So you have a certain fuel to oxidizer ratio. And you might think that, well, OK, the fuel can, can dissociate, it can break down, and so maybe the fuel won't be methane and, and anymore. It might be carbon monoxide and hydrogen or something like that. But overall, the C to H to O ratio is going to stay fixed. But what we're asking here is there, is there a situation where actually the, the composition, let's just say the C to H to ratio, could change inside of that control volume? And the answer to that is yes, it could. Thank you. Um, and that's what I want to talk about. Um, so the first one, is there a net enthalpy loss or gain? We can look at Lewis number effects. And so here, I, I talked about it before. Here, I've actually defined it. So Lewis number would be the ratio of the thermal to the mass diffusivity. And we talked about this configuration before. And we had said, OK, if, yeah, so I'm gaining thermal energy. I'm losing chemical energy. But if the Lewis number is equal to 1, the pluses and the minuses cancel. And in fact, we know enthalpy change to first order. This is, this is I want to emphasize it's to first order and stretch rate. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that later. And, um, but in contrast, if the Lewis number is greater than 1, for this, what I'm going to show you later as a negatively stretched flame, then in fact, the thermal energy that's coming in, I'm going to be gaining more thermal energy than I'm going to be losing chemical energy. So I'll actually have an increase. I'll be, there'll be a net um, enthalpy diffusing through the walls of this control volume, and, and I'll get super adiabatic local temperatures. Um, and the opposite happens with this flame, which I'll explain to you later as a positively stretched flame. So that's the Lewis number effect. The opposite happens if the Lewis number is less than 1. Um, now, differential diffusion, that goes to this question around, is there a change in composition? So if you have a, the diffusivity of the fuel and the diffusivity of the oxidizer is different, or even when you start taking into account real, real uh, multi-component diffusion effects, if your fuel has multiple components, if you have a mixture of, let's just say, propane and hydrogen, let's just say your, that's your fuel, well, <clears throat> obviously the hydrogen is going to be much more diffusive than the fuel is. So for example, the, uh, let's, just, let's just assume I have a hydrogen air mixture, and I go to this configuration here. All right, so I'm going to have lots of hydrogen, lots of air coming in. I'm going to have nominally zero hydrogen and zero air down here. So the, the hydrogen and air are going to want to diffuse in the direction of, of the gradient, right? So I'll have a net diffusive flux of hydrogen and air out the side of this control volume. But they're not going to diffuse at the same rate, right? Because hydrogen diffuses faster. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to lose more hydrogen than I'm going to lose air. So the hydrogen to oxygen ratio is going to drop as I, as I move along the streamline. It's not going to stay fixed. Um, and another way of thinking about it is the equivalence ratio of the, of the sort of the macro equivalence ratio is going to drop for this configuration. Opposite would happen if I was running with propane, right? Propane's heavier than oxygen um, at molecular weight of 44. And so if I had propane, then I would be losing less, the diffusive rate of propane would be less than that of oxygen. In fact, the mixture would become richer. Okay. Well, what's the effect of that? Well, it, um, the, uh, if I started out with a lean mixture and I make it leaner, that's going to make my local flame temperature lower, right? Um, and uh, whereas if I had a rich mixture and I make it leaner, let's just say I had a rich mixture of an equivalence ratio of 3, and I reduced the equivalence ratio, now I'm moving it towards stoichiometry, that would actually have a beneficial effect. So what you can see here is this differential diffusion effect. If you have a fuel that's lighter than air, it's going to have the opposite effect if, you're on the, if you're, your mixture is globally lean than if it's globally rich. Whereas if I had propane air, you could just flip the whole thing, right? So if I was, if I think about this negatively stretched mixture, the equivalence ratio or the fuel to oxidizer ratio would drop, which if I was starting out lean would be, excuse me, it would increase for propane air. I said it backwards. It would increase, which if I, if I was starting out with a lean mixture, that'd be beneficial, right? Whereas if I was starting out with a rich mixture, that would not be. So this differential diffusion effect is really interesting because you can see it's a, it's, your, your global stoichiometry, the influence of stretch on global stoichiometry matters, as well as the diffusivity of the fuel and the, the oxidizer matters, as well as the definition of stretch matters. I mean, the sign of the stretch. So everything, this is negative stretch, but if I had a positively stretched flame, for example, if I flipped the direction of curvature, or I had diverging streamlines, it would all flip. 
So there's, you sort of have to ask the question, what's the diffusivity of the fuel relative to the oxidizer? What's the direction of the stretch rate? And what is the, um, uh, equivalence ratio to be the effect of, uh, of stretch. It's actually quite intuitive. You know, you can work it out. And in fact, I would encourage you, for those of you who are working on these problems, don't just take anything for granted. Make sure you're always, you're always working it out and understanding it. So actually, this slide here just repeats what I already said for Lewis number effects. And this slide repeats what I just said for differential diffusion effects. I forgot about it. And I'd made the nice slide. Um, and so I gave the example of hydrogen and, and propane, but the sa same would happen for methane. So if you have methane, it's lighter than air. So a really nice way to illustrate this is the tip of a Bunsen flame, because the tip of a Bunsen flame has this configuration that we drew here. <coughs> so if I have methane and air, um, and I'm losing more methane than I'm than air, what that tells me is that if I'm, if I'm on the fuel lean side of things, if I start out fuel lean, that's going to make me even leaner. And so what you could imagine would be that for methane, the strength of the flame at the tip would be weakened relative to the baseline flame, whereas for propane, it would be strengthened if I was lean. If I was rich, the opposite would happen. Um, in fact, that's what's borne out by measurements. So this is, um, this is some data actually taken from Professor Law's book, Combustion Physics. And I'll let you stare at this. So the top plot is methane air. The, the middle plot is propane air. The uh, and we won't talk about the bottom plot for now, um, the ethylene air. But um, what you'll see is, and the, oh, and by the way, this is the temperature of the uh, tip of the uh, flame. So they actually went in and put in a thermocouple and, or tried to get a, a quasi estimate of this. Now, um, the, uh, and so the data, the, the flame tip measurement is the data. The uh, line is a calculated adiabatic flame temperature. And the x-axis is equivalence ratio. So one is stoichiometric. So first of all, as you might expect, the real temperature is going to be less than the adiabatic flame temperature just because heat losses and your thermocouple is radiating some heat away. So the, the real curve is actually shifted down, right? Methane, the whole curve is shifted down. Propane, the whole curve shifted down. But what's also very clear here is that the methane air curve is also shifted to the right of the calculation. Right? In other words, if you're starting out lean, the flame temperature drops below the calculated temperature, whereas if you're rich, it's higher. And you may not remember the argument I just walked you through, but I'll just tell you that's exactly what I said on this slide. And so no magic. You can all figure this out. You can all go home tonight before dinner and just remind yourself, well, why is, why is methane doing this? Just come back over here and say, OK, methane's lighter than air. More methane's going to be diffusing out than air, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the opposite happens for propane, right? The propane curve is shifted to the left. So in that case, if, you're, if you start out lean, the, uh, because the mixture, because propane is diffusing slower than the air, you're actually the local equivalence ratio so in other words, we need to differentiate between sort of the global value that's coming in the stream tube and the value at the flame itself. So in other words, the value of the global equivalence ratio coming in here is not the same as the local equivalence ratio that's actually being consumed. In fact, it's a little bit richer for the propane mixture, which is why when you start out lean, the flame temperature is higher than the adiabatic flame temperature, whereas if you start out rich, it's lower. Um, so that's, this is a nice kind of graphic demonstration that you know flame stretch is it's a very real effect it's uh, it has a material impact on the local flame temperature and therefore it's going to have a direct effect on re reaction rates and therefore on on flame speeds and and extinction rates and things like that um, and this uh, this plot here this is also from an, an older paper from professor law it illustrates the same point that um, these are some pictures and you know here you're kind of you're looking at luminosity, so you got to be a little bit careful about inferring reaction rates. But presumably, the brighter it is, the uh, the higher the reaction rate is, and probably the higher the temperature. So you can see with propane, pretty clear on the lean side, you can't even see the tip. It looks like the tip may have even extinguished. Um, uh, whereas on the lean side, pretty clear that the um, 
tip is, looks brighter. So this is consistent with what we talked about over here for propane. A little bit harder to see for methane, but uh, for methane, I don't know how good the color, oh, you can see it. You can see it's definitely a little bit brighter up there on the tip, whereas it's definitely diminishing. And if I, probably if you keep going leaner, what will happen would be you'll have a nice robust flame here, but the tip would actually extinguish. If the flame temperature drops too much, though, you'll just extinguish and you'll just be losing fuel <coughs> through the front. And um, okay, so that's flame stretch. Now you might have, for, for let's just say a turbulent flame, um, obviously you're gonna have, the flame is gonna be locally positively curved, negatively curved, it'll have regions where the flow is diverging, where it's converging. Um, and so you're gonna have regions of both positive and negative stretch. And so you can actually see this in some calculations. This is some, um, a calculation done by the group at, at Lawrence Berkeley, John Bell and uh, Mark Day. And uh, so this is a propane, a lean propane mixture, a lean methane mixture, and a lean hydrogen mixture. And uh, this is the, they went and calculated a local flame speed, and the SC denotes consumption speed. So you may remember I talked about an SD is a displacement speed, SC is consumption speed. I'll, def I'll explain to you the difference between a consumption and displacement speed a little bit later. And this is a plot of the local curvature. And what you can see here is that this lean propane mixture, it, um, it likes positive curvature. Excuse me, it doesn't like positive curvature. It likes negative curvature, right? Pretty clear. So that's what's happening actually instantaneously along the, the instantaneous turbulent flame front as the local burning rate is changing. And you can see for this propane mixture, it's changing by what? About a factor of two, right? It goes down to this is 0 0.8, this is 1.6. So in fact, the local burning flame speed or the local mass flux, the local rate at which reactants are getting converted into products per unit area of flame surface is changing by a factor of two for this lean propane mixture. Um, and you can see that pretty clearly here. Now, this is the methane mixture. It's a little bit more scattered. The changes aren't quite as much. We'll talk about, I'll talk about methane in a minute here. Uh, it's easier to see what's happening with hydrogen. Uh, so now hydrogen being, re remember, lean propane. Uh, this is a mixture that's heavier than air, uh, lean hydrogen. Obviously, this is much lighter than air. There's a lot of scatter, but overall, you can see there's this general trend that when you're on the negative side, the burning rates are low, and they go up to much higher values. And you'll, you can, it's pretty clear there's an, at least a factor of 10 variation in the local flame speed of this hydrogen mixture along the flame. So this is, this is a non-trivial effect. And in fact, people have started talking about this, you know, if you think about a hydrogen flame, what are the influences on, say, NOx emissions? Because if you think about NOx being so temperature sensitive, and if you're trying to correlate NOx with an average, a, a, temp a flame temperature based upon an average stoichiometry, the average stoichiometry is changing substantially along the flame. Um, so the, uh, the average, excuse me, the average flame temperature changes a lot. So you're gonna have these regions of the flame which are much hotter than the adiabatic flame temperature calculated up based upon the average stoichiometry, whereas back here they're going to be much lower. And so let's just talk about this plot for a minute. The, the white line denotes, I forgot what it denotes, it's some species isocontour. The, uh, and the red line is the, hydro, is the uh, mass fraction of the OH radical. And uh, just look at the variations. And apparently what's happened is, is the flame is actually extinguished that the stretch rate has been so strong, and that's probably what's happening, all these points down here at zero, is the flame's locally extinguished. Um, you can also see this with the propane. Uh, you can see here it's the, whereas here kind of it lights up on the positively curved so reactants products. So the region that's bulging into, it's convex to the uh, reactants, you can see the concentration of this intermediate radical goes up, whereas here it's on the negative part, the part that's con cave to the reactants. Can you see that red there, or the red there, or the red there? Yeah, you can see that. Now, notice, I mean, in particular, like this plot here, there's a lot of scatter. It's not on a line. Um, and it's important to recognize is that these arguments are quasi-steady arguments, and they're weakly stretched arguments. So these flames are, if, particularly if they're extinguishing, they're not weakly stretched. So it's kind of a linearization about a base state. If, um, and they're also quasi-steady. 
And in reality, these flames are not steady, right? The stretch rate is varying in time. The flames curve this way, then it's curved that way. And so there's a certain lag between the local instantaneous stretch rate and what the flame is instantaneously doing. And that's what's responsible for some of the scatter. Is there a question back here? What's, I'm sorry? Why, why are they running it higher here? I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. I guess just, it's, but it's still pretty lean, is the point. Oh, certainly. Yeah, no, no question. But, but still, it's very lean relative to one, is my point. And so the general trend is, is that when you positively stretch a lean hydrogen flame, it likes that. And if you negatively stretch the lean hydrogen flame, it doesn't like that. And you can sort of see that from this, this result, although there's a lot of scatter. Um, OK, well, let's, um, let's keep going here. So let's, now let's get a little bit more mathematical. <clears throat> so what is flame stretch? So this is a formula from Foreman Williams' book, um, kappa. I'm going to use the, the, the symbol kappa for stretch rate. It's 1 on A, D, A, D, T, where A, it's, so the, let's just, let me just read this. So flame stretch rate is defined as the normalized differential change with respect to time of an infinitesimal flame surface area element. So in other words, if you take a chunk of fluid that at time t equals 0 corresponds to the flame, and then you see what's happening to that piece of fluid along that surface t plus delta t later is the area increasing or decreasing. Um, so for example, it's pretty, it should be pretty intuitive, for instance, that this flame that because of the positive divergence, it's increasing the surface. If I, take a, if I take a line of fluid, the fluid is increasing the surface area of that, uh, of that, that sheet. Um, it's a little bit less obvious why this is negatively stretched. I'll explain it to you later. But uh, this one's pretty obvious, I think. Um, all right, let's uh, go back to our slide then. And um, notice that the units of stretch are one on second. So it's an inverse time scale. That's the other thing I'll, I'll just point out real quickly to you. OK, well, I'm, I'm going to jump over all the details. But now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you some, a couple different expressions for flame stretch rate in terms that might be a little bit easier for you to make sense of. And so here is a formula for kappa. And let's just go to what you can see. Well, let's, let's start here. And um, kappa is basically, I can write it as the sum of two terms. I'm going to call that kappa A and kappa B. So kappa A is what's called the uh, tangential divergence operator. So if you imagine, if I take the, um, let me just draw this on the board. And this is, this is more general than, than a flame. This would just be, let's suppose I take a, an arbitrary surface, and I have some velocity vector field, OK? So velocity vectors, whatever. Now what I want to do is I want to decompose the velocity vector field into the component that's tangential and normal to it, OK? So tangential and normal at the sheet. These are all the same, but you, you get the idea. Tangential and normal, OK? so that's. And the tangential component, I'm just going to call ut. And because there's two components, there's the tangential part in this plane and the tangential part into the board, I'll have ut1 and ut2. So what you can see that, if you look at that first term, it's dut1 by dt1. So what we're asking now is, if I take the velocity tangential to that sheet, is it changing in the tangential direction? So in other words, if I, when I decompose the velocity, if the tangential velocity vector has the same sign, that term is 0, right? But if the tangential velocity is increasing in the tangential direction, then the, that would be a positive term. And the same thing would happen for the, for the other plane. So that's what this tangential um, divergence term is, uh, dut1 by dut2. Excuse me, dut1 by dt1 plus dut2 by dt2. And now I'm going to give that this symbol, uh, grad the grad t dot ut. 
So that's the first term. Um, and uh, so for example, if we come back to this picture here and I take a sheet, if the velocity looks like this, you can if I decompose the velocity vector at the flame into its component tangential and normal, this flame would be positively stretched. Um, OK, and then there's this another term, uh, vf dot n times del dot n. <clears throat> I'm going to call that kappa b. So vf denotes the velocity of the sheet. All right. So again, these terms are, we're going to talk about them in the context of stretch. But right now, I'm just defining it. Excuse me. We're going to talk about them in the context of flames. But right now, I'm just talking them in the context just of a generic surface. So I'm going to define a surface. And for that surface, I can define a stretch rate of that surface. Um, <clears throat> and um, so Vf denotes the velocity of that surface, okay? not the flame speed, not the flow speed, but the velocity of the surface. Okay? So remember, the flame speed is the velocity of the flame with respect to the flow. Uh, so Vf is the absolute velocity of the surface. Vf dot n. So Vf dot n means basically is the surface moving normal to itself. So if the surface is just moving tangentially to itself, Vf dot n would be 0. But is the surface moving normal to itself? So for example, if I come to this picture, if at the next instant this surface looked like that, well, clearly that surf this point has moved from here to here. So Vf dot n would be, be non-0. Whereas if this whole thing just translated to the side, that point would have moved to there. Vf dot n would be, would be 0 uh, for that point. Obviously, this point here wouldn't be. But um, that's Vf dot n. Does anybody know what del dot n is? Uh, well, I first have to tell you what n is. n is the normal to the surface. So does anybody remember from vector calculus what del dot, the, the, the divergence of a, the normal vector is? Well, that's 1 over the radius of curvature. All right. So that is uh, del dot n is 1 on r for a cylinder, which I misspelled, and 2 over r for a sphere. OK? So what we have here is I can replace this by vf dot n over r, or vf dot n uh, times 2 over r. Um, so the point is vf dot n says is the sheet moving normal to itself, and r is it curved. So what this shows with me is, is that stretch, there's really two fundamental contributors to stretch. One is, is the tangential velocity changing along the, the sheet. And two is, do I have a moving curved flame surface? So for example, if I had a, f well, as I'm showing you here, if this was the flame, if this whole flame is moving like normal to itself, that would be that would give me an unsteady curvature stretch term, okay. <coughs> and you can see how both terms would be either positive or negative. So, um, if I have a stationary flame, if the flame is sitting still, not moving, well, in that case, Vf is zero, okay. Um, and then what I end up with, if I come back here, that means kappa b is zero. So the only thing leading to flame stretch is kappa a. Um, so now let's go back to this picture. Why is this flame negatively stretched? Um, steady state flame. Why is why why would this flame be be negatively stretched? What's interesting, sometimes this throws people off because you say you'd think the stretch term would show up from this term right here, but this term is only operable, is only operative if I have a moving flame, if the flame is unsteady. Well, very simple, and I want you all to get super comfortable with this and not to just take voodoo numbers out of your computer codes or your measurements, but that you can actually figure out why stretch rates are positive or negative. So if I have a surface that looks like that, and that's my velocity. Okay, so this is my Bunsen tip, for instance. 
Okay, what do I need to do to figure out stretch rate? I need to decompose the velocity into its component tangential to the plane, right? So let's just do that. No tangential component here. Tangential component there. You probably can't. Can you see these vectors? But can you see how the tangential velocity, you know, it's bigger here, here, and then at the tip, it's zero. But the point is, is that, 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 that that's why the flame is negatively stretched. Notice how, with respect to the flame, the velocity is actually decreasing that, uh, that, that surface area. That's why um, a steady curved flame has, um, is negatively stretched. Because either, so hydrodynamic stretch, this term, this kappa A, it can be interpreted as a variation of the angle between the flow and the flame normal or equivalently as a variation in tangential flow magnitude along the surface. So in other words, if the angle between the flow and the flame changes along the surface, kappa A is non-zero. So this is an example, a, a Bunsen tip, the angle between the flow and the flame changes. And it can change either because the flame is curved, so the flame is, is moving around on you, or because the flow is curved. Either of those change the angle of the flow with respect to the flame. And that leads to this imbalance um, which, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, okay, so let's see here. Now, we can write an alternative expression for the flame stretch. And I don't want you to get too buried in the math, but VF is the velocity of the flame. All right? Now, as I said, VF is actually, I can, what's going to cause the flame to move? The flow, U. So the, the, the flow is, is going to push the flame around, but also the flame itself, a premixed flame, is going to propagate normal to itself, right? So if you think that of the, um, or equivalently, you can think of the flame speed as the, the, the speed with which the flame moves with respect to the flow. So in other words, the flame speed SL will be essentially VF minus U dot N, okay? So the difference between the local flow velocity and the... Uh, velocity of the flame is the flame speed. So if you replace VF then by U and SL, I can, if I do that, then I'm going to get a term that'll be U dot N, del dot N, and I'll get another term that will be SL, um, del dot N. So if I, if I go through all that gory math, I end up with this expression, which is an alternative expression. So you'll see both of these in the literature, what I've called kappa A and kappa B. You'll also see this expression, which has um, the double dot product of n del grad u plus del dot u minus s del dot n. And just to, for tensor notation, so n n double dot grad v is um, <clears throat> in vector notation, or u, excuse me. Can you see the board in the back? OK. This is equivalent to n i n j d u i d x j if you're more comfortable with tensor notation. Um, and uh, plus del dot u, so this is just the divergence of the velocity, minus su, that's, this is the, the flame speed. And remember, the superscript u, I mentioned this yesterday, is with respect to the reactants. So we can define a flame speed with respect to the reactants or with respect to the products. So, S, so that's just be your classical SL. Um, and then del dot n, remember, is 1 over the radius of curvature. So um, by this expression, the flame stretch term that we just talked about here would actually pop out of this term right here. So this term right here is the flame speed times del dot n. Um, and it just comes because of the, just the way the terms mix and match. The, uh, the reason I like uh, this expression is it tells me something different. Notice that, uh, well, here's another way to write it, n dot s dot n, where s is the um, flow strain tensor, OK? So remember, the flow strain tensor is 1, oh, no. Um, apparently, this desk is not powered up. Let's see. Oh, I got, there's a power, I'm right here, thank you. Um, So 
the flow strain tensor S, remember that's one half DUI by DXJ plus DUJ by DXI. You would have learned about that in shear flow. So this is a cool expression because it explicitly relates flame stretch and flow strain. Okay, so now you will notice if you read my book that you will never hear the, you will never read the word flame strain. You will only read flame stretch. Um, and, but if you read the literature, you'll see sometimes people say flame stretch, sometimes people say flame strain. It means the same thing. But here's why I think I would encourage you all to be a little bit more uh, picky about nomenclature. Flame stretch is a surface defined quantity. It's not defined with respect to a volume, right? You stretch a surface. Um, in other, and so if you go back to these expressions here, for instance, we said is the, if you take the velocity and you decompose it tangential to the surface. Well, I've gone way over time, haven't I? No, no, we go till three. Three. Okay, I thought I'd gone 45 minutes over. Sometimes when you start talking, you lose track of time. Um, okay, it's defined with respect to a surface. So the velocity, what is the velocity with respect to that surface? Is it increasing or decreasing? What's the velocity of the surface itself, the VF term? Um, it's a surface quantity. And in fact, when we start talking about strongly stretched flames, one of the, the issues we're going to run into is it starts to get kind of edgy or a little bit ambiguous to define flame stretch because the flame is really not a surface. The flame has finite thickness. It's not, a sh it's not an infinitely thin sheet. But for now, let's just forget about that. But basically, again, stretch is defined with respect to a sheet, a surface. Strain is defined with respect to a volume. Okay, So you strain a flow, right? You can shear it, you can dilate it, uh, you know, and you, you can change its shape. You can have normal strain or shearing strain. Um, so to me, I like to keep those words in, uh, separate. You stretch a surface, you strain a volume, okay? So in my book and in these notes, what you'll notice here is I always use the word stretch for flame stretch and I use strain for flow strain. Anyway, what this expression does though is it very nicely relates flow strain, which is S, uh, where S is defined like this, and flame stretch. And you see they're not the same thing. And sometimes, in fact, people kind of conflate them or they, they, they interchange them. You know, in a region where you have very high flow strain, the flame will be highly stretched. Well, that may or may not be. Because you can see it's, it's this double dot product of N with respect to S. What's how the flow strain is aligned with that surface that affects whether or not you will in fact be stretching a surface. So really the question is, if you take a fluid which is being deformed and you place a surface in it, a rubber band surface, will the surface be increasing or decreasing in, in length and surface area? Okay, so we're gonna call that kappa S, that term. And then the other term I'll call kappa curvature, which is just the flame speed divided by the radius of curvature. So this expression here, where kappa is equal to kappa S plus kappa curve, in this expression, where kappa is kappa A plus kappa B, totally equivalent. They just give you two different insights into, into um, <clears throat> uh, the, the flame stretch. For me personally, I like to use this expression for kind of fundamentals. So if I'm analyzing a flow field or I'm, I'm looking at what's going to happen, I use this expression to figure out, is this going to stretch a flame and what will be the, the sign of the stretch? Because to me, this expression is very intuitive. It's also a little bit harder to, to actually analyze with data. If you're, if you're actually using real data to analyze it, you know, calculating VF means you've got to get two instantaneous pictures of the flame sheet and you've got to figure out what point to coincide with what point. This expression is easier to actually evaluate from, from computational or, comp, or, or data. That's, so I like to use this expression when we're actually doing a calculation and I use this expression for kind of understanding of the physics. But they're, but they're completely identical. And just remember, that the difference is, is that in here the curvature term is being multiplied by the flame speed, which is always non-zero and it's always positive. Um, whereas here, the curvature term is being multiplied by the velocity of the sheet, which can be positive or negative. Um, So I guess just an important point here is coming back to this expression between flow uh, stretch and strain is flames can be stretched in a flow that's not strained um, and flames can be unstretched in a flow that's highly strained. They're not the same thing. They're related but they're not the same thing and we're going to explicitly look at a couple examples later on. Um, 
Okay, so I uh, let's see, we talked about steady stretch. Now if we do unsteady stretch here for a minute. Um, so if I have motion of a curved flame, so this goes back to the uh, this term here, that kappa B term. Um, if I have motion of a curved flame, that 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 uh, flame is stretched. But what's interesting, though, is just because a flame is curved does not necessarily mean it's stretched. Um, so, for example, so we've talked about this example. A second example would be this one. Nah. Suppose I had the same flint curved surface, but I had a purely um, a purely 1D velocity field. So this would be a velocity field where there's no strain as drawn in. Here I draw in a velocity field um, that would be strained. Um, but what's the big difference between these two? Yeah, so the tangential velocity, so if, if, this, if these flames are steady, Vf dot n is 0. And so what the easier way to evaluate this term right here, if you're actually going to evaluate it, you could use either expression. So you'd have this term, which would be non-zero. You'd have this term, would be non-zero. But in fact, they'd cancel each other. You get zero. It's much easier to use this expression to evaluate the stretch rate for this flame, because Vf is zero. And then it's just the tangential divergence operator. And because the tangential velocity is identically zero, it's zero. This flame is unstretched. So curvature and stretch are not the same thing either. Um, what curvature does is Either it causes the stretch surface to move, like blowing up a balloon, right? So if the, if, the, if the surface is moving normal to itself, I'm increasing the area of a balloon when I blow it up, right? But if the surface is stationary, what curvature can do is it can cause the tangential velocity vector to vary along the surface, like the Bunsen tip. So that's, again, fundamentally the mechanism for stretch comes back. Uh, that's why I really like this expression for, for the fundamental mechanism for stretch. Um, so a stationary spherical flame or a stationary cylindrical flame where the velocity is, is normal to it everywhere is, uh, is stretchless. All right. So <clears throat> does anyone have any questions? Yes. Real world example for what? The, uh, well, people try to make these. Um, where you will, um, well, a real world example would be a, 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 a for a stationary flame, no. For a, 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 like an explosion would be an example of a, of, of a, of an unsteady curved flame where the flame is propagating out. Uh, in the in the lab, people will try to make these things to um, to evaluate. You know, to, there, there's, it turns out there's some really interesting fundamental properties of flames that you can evaluate. So people will try to generate those. But in terms of a real world example of a stationary flame where the velocity is normal to it, I don't think so. But um, it's still an important, it's, it's a nice pedagogical example to look at because it's a reminder that it's not the curvature that gives you stretch. It's the variation of the flame with respect to flow that's stretching the flame. <coughs> um, OK, let's uh, get a little bit more mathematical here and let's start. So I want to now talk, I haven't mentioned this before, but in Implicitly, everything I'm talking about is weak stretch. And um, the reason that I have it's been implicit is I've, we've been sort of taking a baseline understanding and assuming that the nominal flame stru structure is the same as the unstretched flame, and it's just slightly perturbed. So we're, we're linearizing around that base state. So if we assume that the, but mathematically, what we can actually do is you can do an asymptotic analysis. And you can assume that the flow is sort of the then flow is nominally unstretched. And then let me add just a tiny bit of stretch and let me see the effect of the flame. So asymptotic analysis shows that in the linear limit of weak stretch, 
the effect of these various types of stretch. So I've talked about how kappa can be decomposed as the sum of kappa A plus kappa B, or as the, the sum of kappa S plus kappa, kappa curvature. Turns out in the linear limit, the flame does not care. It only cares about what's kappa. It can be due to unsteady curvature. It can be due to steady curvature with streamlined divergence. It can be due to non-zero hydrodynamic stretch. It can be due to zero, excuse me, hydrodynamic strain or zero hydrodynamic strain. Flame doesn't care. All it cares about um, is the overall stretch rate in, in, in terms of what's the flame speed, what's the flame thickness, and so forth. And so, um, and just to illustrate that point a little bit more, so if we take the flame speed, and here I'll write S superscript U, where the superscript means the flame, the velocity of the flame defined with respect to the reactants. Um, the flame speed, as we've just shown you, it's a function of the stretch rate, kappa. And um, so what I can do is now I can expand SU of kappa around kappa equals zero. So that will equal SU when kappa equals zero plus ds by d kappa times kappa plus ds squared by d kappa squared times kappa squared. You know, you can just expand this thing out. But I'm just going to keep the first order term here. So zeroth order term, first order term. So this first term, I'm going to give a superscript naught. So SU comma naught. This would be the unstretched flame speed with respect to the reactants. All right, so if you do a Chemkin calculation and use premix, if any of you have done that, the, the, what you're backing out usually would be SU comma naught. Um, this term right here is the sensitivity of the flame speed to stretch, right? It's dSU by d kappa. So it's what it's saying is if I stretch the flame, if I have a non-zero kappa, how much does the flame speed change? I'm going to call that the Markstein length, all right? So, and that is actually given a symbol, delta M, Markstein length. And it's important to note that the Markstein length is always defined. It, there's not a universal definition of Markstein length. Markstein length is always defined, that's what I'm saying here, with respect to the isosurface used to define it. So for this case, what I'm really doing is I'm defining the Markstein length with respect to um, basically the, the, the reactant side of the flame. And I'll explain what I mean by that a little bit more later. Um, so what I get then is, and just for historical reasons, this term right here is just equal to the negative of the Markstein length because George Markstein defined it that way. So it's SU comma naught minus the Markstein length times kappa. All right. So the flame speed of a lightly stretched flame will equal its unstretched value minus kappa times its sensitivity to stretch. All right. Um, what I can also do is I can normalize this thing. These are all dimensional quantities. As you might guess, well, the, the units of flame speed is meters per second. The units of kappa is 1 over seconds. So therefore, the units of the Markstein length is length, meters, right? That's why it's called the Markstein length. But it'd be nice to non-dimensionalize all this stuff. So let's normalize this. And let's write it like this. So I'm going to normalize everything by the unstretched flame speed. So SU divided by SU naught. So I'm going to get 1 minus this whole thing divided by SU naught. And then what I can do is I can multiply and divide by SU naught. And that's going to give me a Markstein number and the Karlovitz number. So the Markstein number is going to equal to the Markstein length divided by the flame thickness. The Karlovitz number is the flame thickness times kappa divided by the flame speed. And by the way, I misspoke. I said we're going to multiply and divide by the flame speed. What we did was we multiplied and divided by the flame thickness. You'll see it on the bottom here and on the top there. So it cancels out over here. Um, now the superscript not, again, this is purely definitions, but here the Markstein number, I'm defining it with respect to the unstretched flame thickness. That's what delta F naught means. All right? And this Karlovitz number is being defined with respect to the unstretched flame thickness and the unstretched flame speed. So what you can see this is, is for example, the Karlovitz number, you can also write it as kappa divided by SU naught over delta F. What are the units of flame speed divided by flame thickness? W one over seconds, right? So it's basically a Kappa, you can think of as like a flow time scale. That's why it's a Karlovitz number, or the inverse of a flow time scale. And delta F over SU is the flame time scale. So it's, a, it's basically a flow of a flame time scale. And so these are two very commonly used um, dimensional, dimensionless numbers. This is the dimensionless sensitivity of the flame to stretch. This is the dimensionless flame stretch rate. So you're taking the absolute stretch rate and you're normalizing it by sort of the natural flame time scale. Okay, 
Continuing our discussion of weak stretch effects. So the Marxy number, it turns out, it contains all the stretch effects we described previously. We re remember we did our phenomenological analysis and we talked about how Lewis number mattered, how the diffusivity of fuel with respect to oxygen mattered, how the equivalence ratio mattered, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all that physics is, is, is in the Markstein number. Because basically what we talked about before was that we said if the flame is positively or negatively stretched, that's if kappa is positive or negative, will the flame speed, which is the left side, go up or down? And you can see here if the flame is positively stretched and the Markstein number is positive, then the flame speed will go down for a positively stretched flame for a positive Markstein number. If the Markstein number is negative, the opposite happens. The flame speed goes up if you're positively stretched flame speed goes down if you're negatively stretched, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna n jump over the details, but if you back up in your notes, over here, and you think about this analysis that we did, we kind of did this phenomenologically, and you just use the notation that we have, what you'll find out is a lean hydrogen mixture, that's equivalent to saying that it has a negative Markstein length. A rich hydrogen mixture has a positive Markstein length. Propane is the opposite. So if you just put it in terms of the Markstein number. And I'm not gonna walk back, but I'll just invite you to check me on that tonight. Um, so in other words, if you have lean mixtures of fuel that are lighter than air, for example, hydrogen and methane, or rich mixtures of fuels heavier than air, like propane, you have a negative Markstein length mixture. And then conversely, the other example would be Markstein number is greater than zero. Um, So, let's just do an example here. This is, um, this is some data from this combustion flame paper. This is propane air, all right? And here is the stretch rate. So these are all positive numbers. So this is a positively stretched flame. So if we go back over here, whoops. We said that if propane is rich, the Markstein number is going to be negative. If it's lean, it'll be positive. So let's check that. So you can see here, this is a rich mixture. If I have a negative Markstein length and I positively stretch the flame, the flame speed goes up. That's right, right? That's what this expression says. If that's negative and that's positive, the left-hand side is going to go up. And this is data. I measured it. Sure enough, the flame speed goes, as you positively stretch the flame, the flame speed goes up. The way you measure this type of data, by the way, a really simple way to stretch a flame positively is to use a stagnation flow. So you take two jets and you stagnate them into each other, or you take a wall and you stagnate a f the flow into the wall, and you get a diverging flow. You get this flow right here. It's a really easy way to positively stretch it. And the way you can dial the stretch rate up and down is you just turn up and down the velocity. So super convenient way, and it's done all the time experimentally. So I'm going to guess that this is how this was measured. Now, if you look at the lean mixture, so this is 1.8. You look at the lean mixture, uh, yeah, the flame speed drops as we increase the stretch rate. And what you can see is sort of like the, 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 the um, phenomenological analysis su suggested that the sensitivity should flip when phi is equal to 1. Well, when you include all the physics, Lewis number effects and differential diffusion effects and real um, temperature dependence of CP and all that affects, it turns out it's not an equivalence ratio of 1, but it's 1.4. Okay. So in other words, we can't quantitatively figure out where the sign flips from that phenomenological analysis, but we can qual qualitatively say when it's rich, it's going to go up, and when it's lean, it's going to go down. Um, so that's propane error, and now I've plotted it as a function of stretch rate. And so the slope of this line, notice, is the Markstein number, right? Um, or the negative of the slope of this line is the Markstein number. So the Markstein number is 0 at 1.4. It's, it's negative 1.8. It's positive 0.8. So what I'm plotting on this graph is what I've done is I've extracted a bunch of data. Also, this is from Chang et al.'s paper. And we're plotting Markstein numbers. So rather than just, I don't need to show you all this because I've just told you that I can just extract, I can parameterize this line by a single number, the slope of that line, or the, the negative of the slope, which is the Markstein number. So this plot is the slope. It's the Markstein number. And um, as a function of phi. All right? So you can see propane, that when I am lean, the Markstein number is positive. And when I flip past an equivalence ratio of around 1.4, the Markstein number flips negative. 
So in other words, what we could do before is we could figure out the sine of this curve, and we, we, we know that somewhere around phi equals 1 is when the magic happens, when it flips from being <coughs> um, uh, having a positive value to a negative value. So propane looks like that. It's got you know ethane. This is also another fuel that's heavier than air. It's got ethylene. Now methane looks like that. It's the sign flips, right? So we could we could predict this phenomenologically. So in other words, if I'm really lean, my Markstein number is going to be negative. If I'm really positive, the Markstein number is going to be is going to be um, positive. But again, you can see the crossover. It doesn't happen at phi equals one. It happens at phi equals 0.75. So this is just, you know, you, you'd have to go in and do a detailed calculation or measurement to figure that out. But I guess my main point is this: this is real. This happens. In, in these, so you get dimensionless sensitivities, which are which can really, really change flame speeds. Um, here I have some other data. This is actually, I should have put this on the previous slide, but just to illustrate the same idea, this is again, this is now dimensional uh, flame speeds versus dimensional stretch rates, dimensional positive stretch rates for some heavy, a very heavy fuel, uh, uh, iso-octane. Um, and uh, so you can see, look, like for at equivalence ratio 0.9, you know, you can see there's a factor of two change in the flame speed. So, um, we'll, and we'll get to this in a minute here. Why don't we, uh, it's 3 o'clock, break time, reconvene at 3.15.